Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, great to see you. Uh, first off, a huge apologies for not being able to be there with you in person. I was uh, hoping to get there, and uh, my travel got messed up, and so I couldn't uh, couldn't make it. Uh, but uh, I've been following along on Twitter. It's been pretty awesome to see all of the things happening. So uh, pretty exciting to see all of the um, all of the discussions going on. Um, uh, great. So what I want to talk about today is um, I'm going to give a, a a version of a talk I gave recently at uh, the Piltdown Summit, um, talking about Falcon's mission and vision, uh, the Falcon economy and businesses around it that are uh, promising in the in the short to medium term, and then um, kind of a, a discussion about working backwards from success, meaning. Um, let's sort of visualize success for the entire network in the long term, uh, and what does the network have to look like, and then work backwards from from that sort of scale. Uh, great. So uh, uh, overall, the, the this and this uh, some parts of this talk are in other talks um, uh, that I've given before. So uh, I'm going to kind of go in a little bit more condensed uh, this time around. Uh, but if you want to kind of dive deeper into into this, um, this segment is is um, it, uh, here in this talk that I that I linked. Uh, so, like I mentioned, this is coming from uh, Build the Summit, which was a great gathering of uh, a lot of the developers in the Falcon community uh, talking through all kinds of um, problems and all kinds of uh, opportunities for improvement and, and upgrade trajectories and uh, new ideas for new technology and so on, uh, which was, a, uh, was really great uh, gathering a lot of super productive, a lot of great things came out of it. And um, uh, I look forward to having more of these uh, over time. Uh, I think there were uh, a ton of folks who wanted to have uh, these potentially co-located with Pill, Pill City events in the future or or things like that. Uh, cool. So uh, Falcon is a large scale system. Uh, it involves many different components. Uh, it uses a blockchain to uh, coordinate itself. Uh, it builds a decentralized market. Um, through that, it, it powers a decentralized storage cloud. On top of that, you can build an application platform. All of it is steered by a decentralized economy. Uh, then gives rise to a broader ecosystem. And, and through all of these components, you can build a, a large scale uh, open service. And uh, the mission of Aquan is to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information. Um, there's a lot there, but e each one of these words is, is just chosen very carefully. Um, the mission has been around in the Falcon project for uh, a long time, since the very first, um, uh, or components of the mission have been around since the very first um, uh, website and paper, paper were published. And uh, this got fleshed out um, along the way over the years, uh, heading up to mainnet launch and, and beyond. And uh, uh, we did, uh, I'll kind of spend a little bit of time talking about each one of these words. So first off, like why decentralized? What do we mean, mean by that? Um, the internet today is controlled by, um, it, it's set up and controlled by a set of systems that um, at the end of the day are built up on um, various contracts and structures that um, could, that are somewhat malleable, uh, that if push comes to shove or, or if um, incentives change, uh, th those contracts will uh, will get renegotiated or refigured out, and and so at the end of the day, the internet does not actually protect uh, humans. Doesn't actually protect human rights uh, in a way that that um, it would be great to uh, great to have. So um, ideally, we can build a network where um, we can encode the rules that we want into the system, uh, so that no party, no group, uh, no ind individual uh, group of, of parties could. Take control of the system and subvert the contracts and the and the structures that uh, parties have agreed upon. And so th this this is a key foundational principle in the entire Web three movement, um, and sort of gives rise to a set of set of values that can be instantiated by a set of systems. Uh, but at the end, the end of the day, centralization comes from a perspective that you want a system uh, that can be dependable to bake in human rights into the stack, um, and you do that through the use of cryptography, uh, economics mechanism design and so on to build a large scale uh, open service and platform. Uh, we also need this platform to be efficient. Uh, we need the market to be successful uh, commercially. We need the market to be successful um, or, or it, it won't, uh, it won't um, beat other systems and it won't uh, be used to build uh, the infrastructure. At the end of the day, if we want our applications to be, uh, to benefit from this kind of um, platform, uh, they need to be built upon the most efficient clouds. And so therefore, Falcon to succeed has to be an extremely efficient system. Uh, so that means uh, we need to um, be able to leverage uh, certain cost reductions that may not be available to various groups. It means uh, leaning into the market-oriented structures of Falcon to um, enable uh, offering the best possible prices to uh, to customers and to, to end users. Um, it also means uh, 
figuring out all kinds of inefficiencies in the system and over time removing them. So meaning getting extremely close to um, optimal efficiency based on like what the hardware, what the laws of physics can give you. Uh, so so over the, that doesn't mean you have to start there. It just means you have to have a process for getting there and, and a, a, a technology evolution trajectory that, that can get you to that level of efficiency. Um, it also means that we need to uh, improve large scale things like the current proof of replication, which is um, pretty slow. It sort of gives you um, a, a kind of like tape oriented um, uh, uh, time uh, but ideally, that should be uh, normal in, in terms of uh, hard drives and SSDs and so on. Uh, we want th that level of efficiency to get into the protocol. Uh, we also want the network to be robust. So this means we require uh, a perfect uptime, uh, just as good as any other service on the internet. Um, clients need to be able to trust the, the data that they add to Filecoin, that the applications they, they add to Filecoin will be safe. Um, applications need to be able to trust that not only will that data be safe in the long term, um, but especially when there are um, smart contract applications, um, they sort of become robust and, and, and kind of walk away safe. So today, in, information on the internet is not robust in this way. Um, if you stop in, interact, if you have some account in a in a current centralized cloud storage platform, and you no longer, if you sort of like uh, walk away or like you you remove your credit card or whatever, that account uh, kind of ceases to to operate. Uh, it'd be great to have a structure where you can embed economic primitives into the system and then walk away. So that means um, you either deposit enough money for it to uh, survive in the long term in terms of, you know, think of perpetual contracts or similar kinds of structures, um, or there's some uh, set of mechanisms that produce value along the way uh, that maintain the data, that maintain the applications that are being, being added. So we want a, a structure in smart contracts that is able to operate with um, other uh, with automated automated agents in the chain without having to require additional intervention over time. Uh, we also want robustness to all kinds of attackers. So this means uh, whether it's uh, hackers that are trying to um, uh, steal data or or, um, uh, or or hold data ransom or things like that, uh, or whether it's uh, more sophisticated attackers that are trying to um, figure out what um, figure out uh, spy on users and figure out what what they're what kind of data they're using or storing and so on, um, or potentially subverting, trying to subvert the entire network. So we need large-scale robustness in the platform itself to be able to uh, withstand large-scale attacks. This means you know, censorship and, and things like that. Uh, and, and like the internet, the, the platform needs to be built uh, to withstand all kinds of uh, disaster scenarios. So today, um, the internet is highly resilient and is able to deal with massive scale partitions, um, but blockchains do not. Uh, most blockchains are not able to tolerate that kind of partition uh, environment. And that's a, a goal for Filecoin in the long term, to be able to have that kind of robustness, um, uh, just like the web, just like the normal internet. Uh, we tend to describe this word foundation. And what we mean by that is that the protocol itself needs to give rise to a platform that other technologies and other applications can be built upon. Uh, this means uh, the, the, the data storage itself um, should, should enable all kinds of uh, systems uh, for different kinds of uh, storage and retrieval access, uh, following different kinds of patterns. Uh, it should be a platform for lots of applications to be able to write up uh, on top of uh, the Filecoin network. Uh, and so that means that um, the Filecoin network has to, over time, uh, become, become an extremely good developer platform uh, competing with uh, any kind of centralized uh, 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 developer platform. So, so that, that means paying very close attention to um, all kinds of de developer experience uh, to figure out to make sure that we are um, orienting the the network correctly and orienting the the improvement of the systems um, in in the right direction, uh, it also means that the, the network has to to be scalable. That it needs to be able to scale to to the demands of of um, uh, real world applications. And Falcon does that today with with the storage side. Um, we have the world's largest centralized storage network, and it's actually large enough to compete with massive scale centralized um, uh, platforms. But, but the blockchain itself right now is not scalable yet. Um, the rest of the uh, blockchain industry is sort of stuck in this in this environment where we can't get the we, we haven't gotten the, the chains themselves to scale. Uh, so there's one one really important component that um, uh, Falcon needs to needs to bridge uh, needs to bring lo very large scale scalability to be able to deal with um, the kinds of applications that we use on a daily basis. Think of you know normal consumer applications like social networks and um, you know personal cloud 
things and games and so on. Now, um, when we say humanities information, we mean the union of humanities information. We don't just mean the information that a lot of us agree is really valuable. We want Fatma to be used for everything. We want to be build a platform that can store um, all of humanities information, that can store all human knowledge, all you know, think of all scientific papers and data and, and uh, historical, historical write, writings, but also all kinds of you know, your personal application data, uh, your, uh, your um, com company data, all, all kinds of things that people care about uh, should be able to write on top of on top of Filecoin. Um, and so the network is built for for that that um, uh, with that mission to be able to uh, be a great platform for all of the data in in, in the world, not just uh, some intersection that people uh, uh, that a lot of people agree is valuable. Uh, we want Filecoin to become uh, sort of like the default external hard drive for uh, for all computer users or the default um, a cloud storage platform for for applications. Uh, so there's a lot going on in order to to enable this to to uh, work and to, and to happen, and all kinds of improvements and upgrades that that, that will come over time uh, to be able to to get there. And the community as a whole is um, uh, building toward towards this. Um, one thing to remember here is that Python is a, is part of a much larger network of protocols that uh, are developing and solving all kinds of problems uh, related to these to these goals. Uh, so uh, if, given this kind of view into Kind of the broad platform master plan in the past, where you know, sort of step one is build the world's largest decentralized storage network. We've effectively done that. Um, you know, huge kudos and, and congratulations to all of the people um, in the community. A, a lot of you there present right now uh, who have contributed to to this uh, to, to building this kind of kind of scale of, of network. Um, step two is to onboard and safeguard humanity's data on, into the network. Uh, so that means uh, scaling the data storage uh, side, scaling the the way in which data gets ingested into into Filecoin and, and and these systems, and we've seen an enormous amount of success there in the last year. Um, we've, we've scaled the amount of data coming into into the network. And step three is to bring compute to the data. Uh, that means once users add data to to the network, they want to be able to use it for various kinds of applications, uh, and so they need to be able to run computation on top of the data, whether whether that's uh, a web application or whether that's some large data processing pipeline or um, AI models or whatever you want. Uh, we should, you should be able to bring the computation to the data and run it close to, to where it is. Uh, and so for that, there's this sort of breaks down into three uh, uh, tracks, of, tracks of work. Uh, the first one is, is FEM, which uh, is about bringing programmability to the blockchain itself. Um, and that shipped, uh, there was a long running project that took I think about two years to, to uh, on the order of two years to develop. Um, and and sh uh, shipped earlier this year, and, and it's been awesome to see all of the all of the applications that, that people are building um, uh, on top. The second category of the second sort of track of work there is uh, these compute over data uh, networks. So this means uh, there's going to be uh, because of how computation works, and because of how we can achieve verifiability and privacy in computation, uh, we're going to end up with lots of different compute networks that use different technologies to achieve. Uh, those privacy or, or uh, verifiability requirements. And those different, uh, we want those different networks to be uh, sort of like L2 compute networks built on top of Filecoin. And so we, um, there's a whole range of work in terms of building a, a, a set of primitives to enable these kinds of computer over data networks to, to thrive and develop in uh, on top of the Filecoin network. Uh, really great mentions here for, for the Bacalao project, which um, is sort of creating a, a, a a, a pretty generalized way of of, of interconnecting um, uh, different uh, work uh, sort of worker nodes uh, to be able to run computation uh, and to be a good substrate to be to build a, to build specific computer or data networks on top. Um, and and one of the uh, areas where where I think this is going to be this is most exciting to to a lot of groups is being able to bring uh, the power of AI models on top of the. Uh, on top of the data that's stored in Filecoin. And so uh, the LilyPad network is, is a great example of, of, of doing that already, where you can start running various kinds of models on top of on top of the network. Uh, the last track of work here is IPC, which is uh, this large scale uh, project to um, bring that scalability uh, to the blockchain, bring the a massive scale, planetary scale scalability, uh, where you're able to um, run normal consumer style massive scale applications directly on top of blockchains. Uh, this is a, a longer term project um, uh, as well. This requires um, a, a lot of um, building components and getting the developer experience right and so on and figuring out all kinds of cross-chain 
uh, invocation questions. Um, but we want to be able to get to the spot where you can run uh, truly massive scale applications directly on on chain. Uh, cool. So that's that's kind of a view into into the the broader uh, cloud foundation and kind of, and, and how we're uh, how we're doing. Uh, I want to touch a little bit on the economy and the business uh, and, and the set of businesses building on top of Filecoin. Uh, so first off, um, the Filecoin network is a pretty large ecosystem with lots of different participants. It's a decentralized marketplace. Um, many different groups are involved. Um, they run their own businesses. They they run their own um, operations. They're, they're pretty different. Um, and so it's hard to sort of like generalize exactly how um, all, all of the network operates. Uh, but you can sort of like squint at it and look at it like a an, an island economy. Uh, and so think of you know um, crypto networks more like countries uh, where there's some currency that runs the the transactions uh, within the the economy of that country. Uh, but there's all kinds of systems and services and businesses uh, transacting in that in in that currency. Uh, and so if you kind of model it this way, then you can reason about the kind of internal tra the transactions internal to that economy. You can reason about imports bringing value into the economy um, or exports um, taking value out of the economy, uh, or, or sorry, sending sending value out of the economy to other to transact in other in other um, in other economies. Uh, so the so, so over time, the the economy um, grows when there's a lot of internal transactions, when many more uh, systems and services are being uh, built uh, within the network, um, and and it, and the when the sort of like imports uh, start exceeding the the exports, meaning that the the economy has to import more valuable services than it exports out to the, the rest of the world, then then sort of the economy shrinks. If the economy is able to uh, uh, create a lot of exports uh, and exceed the imports, then the, the economy will grow. Uh, you can sort of like think of this model kind of like this, where there's you know a set of um, internal businesses within the Falcon economy. Um, there's all kinds of participants that are um, using the network itself to um, uh, sell services or sell, sell goods. Uh, and that kind of economic activity um, uh, is sort of like the internal businesses within, within the Falcon network. Uh, then there's you know the the spending of of Falcon itself, like the consumption of the token, which um, is used to run applications directly on the chain. And so that means a, a gas usage and and so on, whether for you know running applications or running L2s or uh, fees and so on. Uh, then you can think of you know the set of exports or imports in in economy. So the exports are when the economy, uh, sells some service to the rest of the world, to the to other economies, and therefore um, transacts and brings other value in other currencies into the network. So this is where why the arrows are sort of pointing in, why the word exports has arrows pointing in, because uh, value is being brought into into the economy. Um, or when there are imports, um, the network is uh, paying for uh, other goods or other services in built in by other economies. Um, and so when when the uh, imports and exports um, are balanced, then, then the economy is, is, will, will, will be um, roughly in, 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 in equilibrium. When we the exports exceed the imports, uh, the economy will grow over time. Um, now, kind of like looking at exports for a moment, you, you can sort of model the Falcon economy um, and you know set of various markets that it could offer services to. Uh, you can think of the Web3 storage market, uh, though it's uh, quite small still. Uh, it's a really valuable market. There's all kinds of important applications being built there. You can think of you know, the archival storage market, the content delivery network market, the cloud object storage market, the consumer cloud storage market. All of these are different markets that the Falcon um, economy can serve. Uh, and in order to achieve any one of those, it requires different um, products and tooling and services to be able to meet the, the product demands from, from that market. And so th this is why lots of different teams are kind of um, in the Falcon community are going after these different markets, uh, building different, different products tuned for that specific market um, to enable that, that uh, success in that particular environment. And um, the community just has to get kind of a, a strong product market fit in um, uh, it, it, just in some of these at, at a kind of a recent, decent scale to start getting to you know, you know, single percentage points or eventually double digit percentage points uh, of market share in those markets. And at that point, um, that, that'll be like a massive scale uh, economic uh, improvement to 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 the network. Um, uh, one point here is like the the web three. So kind of looking at the sizes here, um, you can also start thinking about how these markets might grow or change over time, right? So the web three market is small now, but it'll be big. 
we expect it'll be big in the future. Uh, and so sort of winning that market, though it might not be very successful, very profitable in, in the short term, um, it might be really valuable in the future. And so doing really well in that market matters. Um, but kind of the Falcon Network already set a scale far beyond just the data storage needs of the Web3 uh, market. Uh, so it, it already needs to tap into a lot of these other markets. Uh, so you can think of like all these different um, types of markets as different segments, and, and you can think of their scales, and you can think of sort of comparing them along the way. Um, either way, it, it, I want to kind of talk a little bit about Web2 source markets. Um, so when you think about the, the, the paradigm shifts in technology and when new incumbent platforms arrive and, and replace other um, other systems or, or, or come in to enhance other systems, uh, they usually uh, follow a particular strategy. There's all different kinds of uh, approaches here. Uh, but when you look at many of these successful paradigm shifts, uh, they tend to follow a, a particular pattern. Um, and it's sort of like well, well established in, in a lot of kind of uh, business um, theory and so on. Uh, you, you know, in order to be successful, the, the new entrant has to do basically two things. One, have a set of features that are different, um, that, that create, create product differentiation um, that are hard to copy, meaning that it would be difficult for the uh, incumbents to just copy that feature set. And the second, the new market has to, the, the new entrant has to um, create a very significant cost reduction. Uh, so that means uh, it needs to provide, to, to create a service that a lot of the existing users of the current systems will prefer because of the cost sensitivity um, and not just the feature set. Uh, when, when these new entrants have these two components, they end up uh, performing extremely well in, in, in markets and end up um, growing over time. So as an example, like this is, this is how the cloud um, came into to over, overtake on-premise systems. So, so back in this, and by the way, this transition took about you know, on the order of 30 years to, to effect. Uh, so it was a pretty pretty slow transition to um, to get all kinds of technologies were involved, all kinds of systems and applications got built along the way um, to build this kind of this kind of transition. Um, but but overall, the the cloud gave users a set of differentiated features that things that you couldn't do before in normal on-prem um, uh, systems, and uh, it gave a massive cost reduction initially. Uh, so that that really that that cost reduction it, it is a really key component in order to uh, cause a lot of switching um, uh, initially. Now, over time, the, the success of that new paradigm might push the new paradigm to be so much more successful that eventually that new paradigm can start charging a premium on top of the other solutions. Um, but that usually is kind of a sign of, of, of broad um, installment in the, in, in the broader market and, and broad success. So for example, these days, you, you hear about articles from large companies saying, hey, you can actually save money by moving out of the cloud and doing your own on-prem. Um, systems and yeah, that's sort of like to be expected at this point. Now that the cl cloud has um, so um, uh, won out so so strongly, but that was not the case at the beginning. At the, at the beginning, the cloud had to be a cheaper system, a, a cheaper set of systems, a cheaper set of um, operations that would would enable a lot of the you know kind of early um, early adopters and the sort of like early majority to to start adopting this um, this this product set. Uh, so when you think about like sort of like um, build bringing decentralized cloud primitives to, to sort of a centralized cloud world um, and, and to kind of causing this like really important sort of paradigm shift, uh, you have to sort of think about it in the same way. You, you want to have you know, a set of advantages that, that create a, a very strong differentiator, a set of features that are hard to copy, um, that are sort of fundamental to the new paradigm. Uh, you know, things for Falcon there include um, uh, just the verifiability of the, of the storage, the verifiability of the, of the proofs, the provenance, being able to track the provenance of the data, uh, the connectivity to smart contracts and the ability for smart contracts to operate on on the system um, and, and to and to create these kinds of applications that are not run by anybody. Um, uh, other features like being able to recruit massive scale networks um, very quickly, being able to kind of deploy um, specific types of, of facilities, um, uh, kind of, kind of a, a, either at a speed or at a scale that that, that might be hard for for um, uh, centralized parties to do. Um, and, and then kind of like on top of any sort of differentiated features, and, and by the way, there are many more um, di different kinds of features might appear that are relevant to specific markets, right? So different markets care about different feature sets. Uh, and so you have to think about this kind of differentiated feature set on a per market basis. Um, and you know, one of the beauties of smart contracts is that it gives you this really robust platform to, to then build all kinds of new, new kinds of, of things that couldn't be done before 
uh, that, that can themselves become very strong differentiators. You can think of the success of Ethereum as, as, as a version of this. Ethereum has, uh, through this smart contract platform, um, been able to create a, a, a platform with, with differentiated um, feature sets for many different kinds of, uh, of transaction systems with different kinds of transactions, um, and, and that it has enabled it to, su to succeed and, and work really well for, for, a, for a set of markets. Now, the second thing uh, that we have to get right is that really important cost reduction. Uh, so th this is why Flatcoin's design has the block reward incentivizing data storage, uh, not the hardware, uh, but the data storage. That this is where uh, Flatcoin Plus comes from. This is where uh, this is like a key advantage for Flatcoin to to have and retain. Um, so Flatcoin requires this this incentive in order to provide that large scale cost reduction uh, to be able to sort of shift over a lot of the uh, a lot of the customers from centralized cloud systems over to um, to this decentralized cloud setting. Um, the, the kind of like last advantage that I think is a, a really important differentiator that, that sort of applies across all markets is that decentralized networks have this scalable and permissionless innovation that is extremely powerful. So this means the entire because the entire platform is open source, it's an open service, um, anybody can come in and, and improve it and develop their own versions of things. Um, th this sort of creates a, a, a very unique advantage to a platform um, that, that makes it um, more likely to, to um, leverage all kinds of improvements that arrive because it means that anybody can contribute those kinds of improvements along the way and the network just gets better. Um, not, a, not just that, but it, it also creates an environment where even the current incumbents might actually see the benefits of this new paradigm and shift over to join that paradigm. So, so I, I sort of like imagine this kind of like extremely successful win scenario where um, it becomes sort of like a, 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 an advantage even to the centralized uh, cloud players to join the decentralized cloud movement uh, to bring the, that, that set of feature sets and sort of join that join join the environment. Um, unclear if this will happen, but but that would be a, a pretty pretty great win. Um, great. So uh, so kind of uh, moving on. Uh, the, the last thing I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit about is um, when thinking about platform and thinking about systems and upgradability and and so on. Um, a lot of us are thinking about working backwards from success. So that means visualizing how you sort of establish some targets in the future in terms of the pervasiveness of the platform, the, the success case of, of, the, um, uh, of, of, the, of the technology, the success case of, of its adoption in the market, the success case in terms of um, the applications built on it, and so on. And you can sort of like imagine some kind of um, target in terms of like broad market adoption, market use. And so you can sort of like think of, so from there, after establishing those targets, you can look around to the existing applications and the existing platforms and characterize those platforms in terms of what they're able to do today. And you can think about the future and think about you know five years in the future, 10 years in the future, and think about the, how the characteristics are going to evolve in that time frame. Um, how are the things going to have to evolve in order to be successful at that scale? Uh, then from there, you can derive a set of system constraints um, that describe how the system is going to have to behave in order to have those you know, target characteristics uh, to be able to succeed for, for various products. And then from there, you can kind of come up with a, 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 an improvement trajectory from those constraints that starts building out and deploying those specific um, uh, improvement sets and ideally, hopefully ordering them uh, coupled to kind of the, the markets that you want to um, gain adoption in uh, so that you, as you are improving the system, um, you, you, you do so um, bringing in uh, greater and greater uh, adoption and greater and greater success, uh, which then self-reinforces the, the, the growth and, and so on, right? You can think of this as like, um, you know, every major paradigm shift in technology has sort of followed this trajectory where um, as the technology started working and improving, uh, it created, it opened up a lot of opportunity and a lot of success for lots of, lots of parties. Um, and they created an environment where um, they came in to flesh out and improve um, the system itself and, and, and get it to that success. So you can think of the cloud today as, as being super different than the cloud as first envisioned in the, you know, late nineties and so on. Um, and being built out by many different organizations um, along the way that brought in many new kinds of technologies and improvements that are all blended together to yield the, the very successful cloud systems that we have today. So think of kind of evolving these networks in that kind of way of mapping out what they must be in the future in order to be successful, back calculating from that to you know set of improvement trajectories and coupling those improvement trajectories to market success to be able to um, scale up the 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 product and services and grow the, the, the network by um, 
uh, leveraging a lot of other participants that bring in those those improvements. Um, so you know, an example of like sort of like doing this is like you can look at you know all storage in the world, and you can say, okay, great, like let's try and store all of it. Um, you can maybe say, um, you know, draw a certain fraction of it that you may want to store, like call it fifty percent or ten percent or one percent. I sort of see like one percent is like not not ambitious enough and not quite uh, hitting the mission. I sort of see fifty percent as um, hey, great, like let, let's eventually get there. Uh, but in order to get there, you can you know maybe think about ten percent. And so sort of ten percent gives you like this really neat target that you can paint and and um and and hit um without having to get into into and it's still sort of like making it making a reasonable uh reasonable sort of um uh sort of claim now let's kind of think about approximating characteristics uh you can sort of think about the data use uh across these different years uh by thinking about the number of people using the internet the number of devices in the world the number of requests per day that happen the number of data objects all the data all how much data is stored in the world and so on and so you can kind of, um, and you can look around on the internet to find all kinds of estimates produced by various different groups. Uh, here are like a few, um, you know, the, the data on these, um, uh, I, I think it's pretty good. Um, you can get a, a pretty good back of the estimates uh, from, from just browsing around. Uh, but overall kind of most groups predict somewhere between five and 6 billion users will be um, using the internet, uh, you know, throughout, throughout these years. Um, that's of course, uh, humans discounting any kind of AI agents. Uh, you can do the same thing for kind of the number of devices in the world. You can think of uh, you know, various estimates. Uh, uh, the estimates vary a bit, quite a bit, but most of them are kind of in the, in the scales of like 30 to 40, maybe 50 billion by 2038. Um, so this gives you a pretty pretty um, sizable amount of devices. If you sort of think of 10% of that, that means that the Paco network, and you know, depending on which year you want to target 10%, um, needs to be hitting you know, on the order of like three to three to five billion um, devices uh, operating and transacting with the network uh, on a daily basis, right? So, like, th this is a massive scale relative to where blockchains are today. Uh, this is this is kind of like why we need blockchains to scale. Then, um, if you think about like sort of like the numbers of requests per day, um, this is one of these that uh, unfortunately there aren't very good estimates out there for this for these numbers. You can try to approximate it a bunch of different ways. Um, I did kind of like a quick quick estimation, uh, and and I think it's a very conservative estimation. So I think like the, the real figure might be like one or two. Or some magnitude larger, but uh, people say kind of on the order of you know hundreds of trillions of requests per day, um, and you know if you just sort of like think take ten percent of that, that means like ten trillion requests getting data from Filecoin. Like that, that's kind of like what we're talking about. You know, if, if in twenty twenty three we have ten percent of the market, um, that would look like you know ten trillion requests per day uh, hitting the network. Uh, and so we need to build systems that can scale to that kind of capacity. Now, you know, we might want to hit, you know, 10% in 2028 or, or or something like that. And so think of like that trajectory of improvements that we need to have in order to, to get to that scale. Um, or, you know, whether it's 2028 or 2033, uh, um, you can sort of like think about the, the improvement trajectory. Um, then in terms of like number of data objects, uh, the uh, here the estimates uh, also vary a lot. Um, there's some uh, good data from, from a few, especially uh, AWS S3, uh, which is sort of like, Gives you a, a sense of kind of like the in in a kind of peta object scale, um, so that means you know five. Um, I think this is, um, yes, yeah, so this is, I think they, they sort of think about like two hundred and eighty trillion objects um, uh, stored, you know, uh, uh, throughout all of S three. If you kind of imagine, you know, a, a over, around kind of twenty systems, um, you know, being being very conservative, around twenty systems of kind of similar scale. Uh, around the world, you sort of like land in you know five point six quadrillion objects. Uh, if you take ten percent of that, then you know you you end up in you know the you know five hundred trillion trillion object um, uh, scale. Uh, so that that's how many individual objects need to be addressed, identified, um, and and need to have random access, need to have access controls, need to have um, you know all all these kind of metadata and information are random. So um, you know the the we need to be building for that kind of scale of, of, of throughput. Um, now, in terms of like the overall data, um, the you know estimates vary here quite a bit. Uh, there's an enormous amount of data generated in, in the world. Uh, only a small fraction of that gets stored. Um, if we can kind of increase the supply of, of data stores, maybe we can store more of it. Uh, but either way, we, we're talking about you know zettabytes of, of data in the world. Um, again, the estimates vary quite a bit, but and, and, and this is likely to keep growing exponentially. Um, so we're we're in the kind of multi you know, tens of zettabytes scale. If if Aquin has you know uh, sort of ten percent of that, um, that would be you know in the single zettabyte scale 
um, depending on kind of like when when you want to when, when to intersect. Um, so so that's an enormous scale. That's um, the, the good news there is that it's only a few orders of magnitude away in terms of the the, the data stored and only two orders of magnitude away in terms of capacity, which is pretty amazing. Like just in three years, in three years, we've gotten to within two orders of magnitude of, 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 of like this massive level of success. That's pretty amazing. Or like within three orders of magnitude of the total amount of data store in the world. Like that's, that's pretty huge. Um, uh, certainly pretty huge for, for a network this, this young, um, you know, when you think about like the cloud and how long the, the cloud system took to build out and, and grow and so on, like the, they were dramatically slower than this. That's one of the, the beauties of a, of, of an open um, permissionless sort of network. So now if you sort of like think of these as like the target characteristics that we need to be able to hit and you, you know, think of like, you know, that 10%, um, then you can use those to derive system constraints. And, you know, I, I won't go these, through these in detail, but that, you know, you basically back into, you know, storage onboarding needs to be able to scale to zettabytes. You, you need to be able to support writes of all sizes from kilobytes to exabytes. Uh, and, and of course, these look extremely different. Uh, these different scales mean different onboarding systems. Uh, that, that this means you need all kinds of write aggregation systems and structures, uh, familiar structures like buckets and collections and whatnot. It of course means mutability. It means reads of all all of these sizes as well. Um, it means all kinds of latencies of access. You know, from in the low end, you know, things of like single milliseconds being in the same same data center to um, you know uh, three hundred milliseconds kind of around the world, three hundred milliseconds to a second um, around the world in in certain kind of read read rates. Um, and it means we need to be able to leverage all kinds of storage media um, from um, flash to disk to tape. Uh, so today, most of Alcoin is, is, is disk, but over time, it needs to be able to um, support very different kinds of storage media. And so that means poor apps need to evolve along the way. Um, the, this kind of operational throughput requires the chain itself to scale. So that means we need to be hitting millions of transactions per second and then billions of transactions per second and so on. Um, this is why things like IPC uh, make so much sense relative to kind of like where blockchain sites are today. And, and you need the system to be partition tolerant. You need regions for availability and latency and so on. Um, now, from, the, from these kind of constraints, you can kind of think of like a set of improvements uh, and, and uh, a sort of like trajectory of improvements that you might, you might have. So uh, this, all of these constraints require new poor apps. We need fast retrieval. We need poor apps specific per storage media. We need to have you know, DL abstractions that, that can be of any size. You need to be able to identify single small objects. You need to have access controls associated with the data. Um, you need to be able to have composition here. You need to, you need to be able to aggregate small deals into big deals. Um, you need to be able to um, ha have various kinds of aggregator systems to, to give you those mutable collections. Um, you need to be able to index all this data and, and access it uh, with random access. Um, you, you need like very, very good guarantees on retrievability and especially fast retrievability, uh, which means you need um, verification of that retrievability. And that means you need incentive structures coupled to that, to, to achieving that. Um, you need broad chain scalability. You need to localize the, um, the, the chain so you can move specific computation to run uh, in specific areas of the network. Um, you need some decentralized access control structure, which uh, you, you, we can leverage UCANs for. Um, and you need you know things like proof of location to verify that the data is actually in, yeah, where where it's being claimed to be. Now you can take these system constraints and then chart um, a, a trajectory of improvements by picking which ones to work on in which timeframes, um, coupled to specific markets. So right, so different groups thinking about different markets will kind of look at you know these kinds of improvements and say, oh great, like if we can deliver these kinds of improvements, then we can tap into this particular market, and so that's sort of like their improvement trajectory. And, and if we as a network can, you know, can have many, many groups going in these different directions, we can flesh out the entire platform um, by, by building out all of this, this, all of these kinds of feature sets uh, over time uh, in this, this sort of composable way. Uh, cool. So, so this is uh, you know, how, how um, I sort of recommend that we, that we approach the, the trajectory of improvement design, which is you know, establishing very concrete, real market targets, uh, figure out what that means in terms of target characteristics, uh, derive system constraints from that, and then chart a set of, um, you know, come up with a set of improvements that, that we need, you know, to deliver those system constraints, and chart a trajectory of improvement of improvements based on the specific markets and the adoption over time. Um, the last kind of like plug I'll have is is around kind of subnets. Uh, I mentioned this very briefly, but over time I think like the the, the success of Falcon will depend on being able to scale with, um, with with some kind of like region oriented structure, and this is where. Um, IPC becomes extremely useful. IPC gives us this uh, way of get, creating a tree of subnets 
where you have you know each, each of the, the the nodes in this tree becomes like a full blockchain with available with data availability available through partitions regionally constrained and so on um and you can you know think of like generating an environment where you have um you know kind of like the global consensus uh, and that's sort of like the main net and then underneath that you have specific specific subnets for specific uh, continents or specific regions uh, and you can even kind of implement the the notion of availability zones from the cloud just as another subnet um I won't go in, in this is sort of like a teaser for uh future future talks and so on but I, I know I'm over time so I'll, I'll stop here um and and uh you know th these kinds of subnets can be used for all kinds of um, applications and so on uh great uh, I'm gonna stop here uh thank you so much uh sorry for uh, uh blasting super fast for, for All right. Thank you, Juan. Appreciate that. Who has questions or comments or anything for Juan? If you want to just come right up to the microphone, he can see you. You can see him hey, right there. Hi, Juan. <laughs> uh, yeah, question. Um, so I heard a lot about uh, data preparation and uh, like generating car files and things this week. Um, so I'm a storage provider and, um, you know, building onboarding systems, um, also an SP, and um, I got to talk to some of the Lotus devs about a uh, side project they're working on called RIBS that uh, basically gets rid of, like, the need for data prep, like, using, like, native IPFS storage. Um, and even enabling other services like like taking daily snapshots, um, taking the diff and like pushing it in um, into the sectors. So my question is like, why are why am I not hearing more about these uh, kinds of projects right now? Or like like what are you guys doing to enable more service offerings that SPs are able you know to provide to our clients? Uh, that's the main question. Um, it, it, there's lots of different kinds of tools like this, um, and I, I don't know why you're not here by them. I think each of, each of them are discussed in various different places. Um, I think you may not be hearing about it because of the maturity level. So a lot of these are not yet super productionized and pushed in by various um, uh, providers. So I would sort of like, um, what I would sort of recommend is, look at Hit, GitHub pretty aggressively and look at all of the different things that many different groups are building um, and then test out what, what works really well for you and, and, and try, it, try them out. Um, I think maybe we should build as a community some kind of um, like better maps that, that put different kinds of technologies and tools and services um, on, on kind of a spectrum where you, you can compare them across different dimensions. So like, you know, if, if you have data of particular sizes, which tools should you be using um, if you require a certain kind of um, uh, operations, which tools should, should we be using? Uh, that kind of thing can be, I think, extremely useful. And I think we now have enough tools of the, making those kinds of maps uh, would, would make sense to be able to give people like the ability to, uh, to to check those out. And and in terms of like what people are doing, like people are working on all kinds of systems around this. Um, again, targeting very different different groups are targeting different markets, and by targeting different markets, they're targeting different kinds of access patterns. And those different kinds of access patterns in the data are going to give you different type of characteristics in the in the how the system works, right? Like um, storing very a lot of very small objects looks very different than storing, say, a petabyte or something like that. Right. Hi, Juan. Uh, this is Alan. <laughs> So hey. I, I bring the your nest to here. I know. I, I wish I was there to so, get it. I am so sorry. Okay. I'm not there physically. So uh, I need uh, some. It would be great if you can uh, okay. give it to somebody else, and I'll, I'll okay, get it okay, from okay. them. Okay. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, during the three years. Did you show it off, by the way? Did, did you show show off the the awesome hardware that you that you built? Uh, so uh, can I bring that to here? <laughs> so uh, I have uh, some, uh, uh, during the three years, we uh, uh, operated in the Korea, uh, some storage providing, and uh, so follow up the policy from the uh, uh, protocol labs and the foundation side, so every policy and the strategies follow up. But uh, uh, just to, uh, very confusion is coming from the 
plus. So now in this time, just to we just to con uh, concentrate to the peer plus only in this time, and our system and every uh, multi-tenant some, some solution is pit to the peer plus. But uh, uh, I, I heard about the many story and the news about the peer plus some uh, will modified and changing into the some another uh, policy or some addition or something. So uh, can you explain about the clearly a strategy and plan for the peer plus? Yes, I think, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of different groups that have different opinions on on the plus and so on. Um, the the thing that I would remind everybody is just recall that how I talked earlier about um, how we define humanities information. We want to bring all data into the network, not just a, a subset of data that people might think is important. We want to build a platform that can uh, bring tr truly work for for all data. And remember that in order to succeed in a new market, a in order to succeed in a broad market, a new system, a new entrant, a new paradigm has to have a massive cost reduction involved uh, in order to bring to, to get get um, uh, existing uh, uh, groups to switch over to this to this new paradigm at scale. Uh, so that's where Pill Plus comes from. Pill Plus is is the structure that enables Spacoin to route the block reward to data storage, not hardware. Uh, like I mentioned in the in the mission part of the talk. Um, Platform is about data storage. That's why, it, why it's file coin, not hardware coin or disk coin or something like that. Uh, it, it's about routing the block reward to data storage, okay. not to just hardware. And so Platform Plus is a critical component that enables us to do that. Um, the, the way it works is that it, it just tries to answer one basic question, which is, is this like a legit, legitimate data from a, a user with a legitimate intent to store data in the system? Or is it just somebody trying to, to steal some of the block reward? And that's really the only question it's trying to answer. Is it legitimate data, or is it, um, or, or is it kind of like a malicious uh, abuse of the system? Um, and so that's the core uh, set of components. Um, I think a lot of people kind of have um, uh, gripes about specific implementations. And this is where Platinum Plus has a kind of an allocator structure that gives you the ability to build new kinds of systems Within, within the network. So if you don't like the current system, try to propose a new one and, and um, discuss it with the community to try and create like a, a different way of allocating data uh, that can be more successful. Uh, so talk I gave from the Build Up Summit in Singapore, which I think is already on YouTube, that goes into all this allocator structure and, and, and whatnot. But, but from my perspective, like um, the routing the, the block reward to data storage is Filecoin's advantage in the market. And without it, it like, won't be able to, to hit the same kind of like um, cost profiles of the, of the current centralized policy give you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So please text me to, to deliver to, to, to you and then ask. Okay, thank you so much. Do we have anybody else who is interested in talking to Juan? Question, comment, anything? All right, Juan. Cool. I think you're awesome. off the hook. Thank you so much. Thank Great you. See you, See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.